Welcome to the Rider Outsiders, where we talk CFL football on your Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I'm Mitch Wiles, joined with Dylan Robson. And let's get right into it. Dylan, Deron Carter. I'm here, Mitch. How are you doing? Oh, pretty good. What? Deron Carter. Deron Carter. Was there some Deron Carter news? That's right. So in the middle of the Montreal game, it broke that Deron Carter was released. Chris Jones, uh, I guess, said it's time to move on. Oh, my God. So I was at a barbecue, and uh, my wife gave me a text, the screenshot of Deron Carter's tweet. <clears throat> so she kind of broke the news to me, like, right as it happened, which was pretty awesome on her part. Did you believe it when you first <laughs> saw it? You know what? I, I did. I believe it 100%, because that's the riders this year, and under Chris Jones and Deron Carter, yeah, I, I believed it. And, uh, <clears throat> and so I started speculating, well, this has to be because the NFL season's starting up. This has to be for that, you know, and uh, it's not. He's not going to the NFL. So uh, it was shocking. It was shocking. Everyone, obviously, shocked. It's one of those things where it's going to be like, where were you when you heard Deron Carter got released? Yeah, and so so he came out with a tweet right before the, the league, uh, or sorry, the team announced the release. Yeah, well, the tweet was, well, just got the call. I'm out, Sask. Love y'all. Most fun I had in a long time. Sorry, that was a bad read through on the tweet, but <laughs> but he said I got the call. I'm out. Love you, and it was the most fun I had in a long time. And you know there was a scrum I was in a little while back uh, with Deron Carter at the Riders practice, and I, I did ask him, "Are you having fun?" Mm-hmm. And he said, "Yeah." He said, "Yeah, I'm having a blast. I'm having a great time." So, you know, it's simple as that. I think he's a really happy guy, and uh, he does seem to love the game and and just love what he's doing and. Really shocking to think that Jones would just straight up release him. Uh, I'm going to read a Chris Jones quote. Mm-hmm. Actually, before I say that, I'm going to say, when I talked to my wife about this, the Ron Carter release uh, after the barbecue, I said, you know, I really hope it's because he's going to the NFL. I really hope it's because Carter got a, a good gig somewhere else. And uh, and I said, I hope to God Jones isn't going to come into a press conference and say, yeah, we decided to go another direction. So now let me just read this Chris Jones quote from the press conference. Go ahead. I went back and forth in my mind about the decision, and yesterday, about halftime in the game, decided to go ahead and call him and alert him that it was the direction we were going. He said basically exactly what I said. I hope to God he doesn't say that. And he said it. You know, so it's simply because Jones wants to go a different direction. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what he's telling Telling the, the media, yes. Do, do, do you believe there's more underneath there? Well, Chris Jones also said that he doesn't want to go into uh, detail on on some of the reasoning, right? Mm-hmm. So some of that reasoning could be Deron Carter's behavior. There was rumors of that he had gotten into a fight with a teammate after the uh, most recent game. Okay. Uh, so, but Jones said, Jones said, I'm not going to go into any kind of specifics about anything like that. We're not here to put a, put the guy on trial. We released a very good player who I think will end up landing on his feet. So, mm-hmm. but uh, I guess Duran on his Twitter, like his his next tweet was, "I might be done with football, man. Find a job that travels around the world, something where I can be myself." So this sort of sounds like he's yeah, done with football. And, you know, but then there's another report that well, Cavis Reed is trying to reach out to him to bring him back to Montreal. Well, of course, I mean. Can you blame him for wanting to be done with football? He was basically, I mean, he's not had uh, a smooth season. He probably had a big learning curve this season, Mm -hmm. Deron Carter. And he put a lot of work into becoming a defensive player. And then when he was called back to be a receiver, he went out there and he did his job, got a touchdown in the Edmonton game. And uh, and then, so let's say you you do that. Let's say you're at work and your boss tells you to try something different. You do it. You learn your best and, and, and you end up being pretty good at it. Then they send you back to your old gig, and then you do pretty good at that, and then your boss calls you up and says you're fired. Well, yeah, I, I would think that I wouldn't want to work in that industry anymore either. So these are early reactions from mm-hmm. Deron Carter saying, I don't want to work in football. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, this goes back to... getting a lot of hate this year, right? Like a lot of people were a little upset with him playing on defense, and he shouldn't be there. He, he had hate and he had love. I know that. There's both directions. This reminds me of Darian Durant taking that signing bonus from Winnipeg. And Darian Durant says, this game takes from you and takes and takes. And, you know, it's about time that the players get a chance 
to take something back. And so he took that signing bonus and he retired. And and a lot of people got angry at him for that. And then you look at something like this. Well, why was Duran Carter released? Farhan Lalji reported on Twitter that uh, Duran Carter wasn't given any reason for his release. Mm -hmm. He was thanked for his service. And now this is the kicker. Veteran contracts aren't guaranteed until after the ninth game. So the riders aren't on the hook for his balance this year. Well, that's exactly it. That's why I mentioned Darian Durant. You know, mm. basically they they don't have to pay Durant to the full amount that he was told he would get this year. Duran, I mean, yeah, Duran, uh, yeah, a bookkeeping move. And I guess yeah, in, in Duran's what last tweet there, he pretty much said he got a call, or you know he called. Let's take a look. So he, well, we'll just we'll just read it out. So here you go, only saying it once. My teammates started calling me Saturday, asking me questions like, what happened? I eventually text Coach Jones and said, what's the deal? My teammates asking if I'm still on the team. I get a call from him saying, thanks for your service on both sides. That's the end of the tweet. So yeah, there's definitely holes in the story that we're being given. <clears throat> right, because uh, Ron says he's sitting there and he's getting calls from players. Mm-hmm. Jones is saying that he decided at halftime, I'll give Deron Carter a call. And he was still making up his <laughs> and, mind, uh, yeah. But Carter said he texted Jones first. So did Jones, like, did Jones, there was obviously rumblings going on that this was going to happen before mm-hmm. it happened. If the players all suspected it had already happened, I don't imagine that's good for team morale. That's going to leak through the locker room pretty quick once there's word that Duran might be getting released straight out, not even traded. So, but one thing we haven't mentioned was he, he did have two uh, charges before the courts about uh, marijuana possession. So I'm not sure if those have gone in a certain right. direction that may have helped steer the team to, to let him go. It's hard to say. Yeah, that could, be, that could have something to do with it. We never know the the full details and all that. And I did hear, because, you know, the, the Rider Nation, the, the community we live in, it's very tightly knit. And people hear different rumors because they know different people and everything. So I had heard from from others that they had been trying to trade Deron Carter this week, trying to trade him, and they couldn't really? get the right, right kind of value for him. And uh, that that resulted in the release. And plus this being before that ninth week deadline that they could uh, get rid of, get rid of Carter without having to pay the full contract. So, I mean, this was a decision that was sort of multifaceted. So it could have been the charges, could have been the salary, could have been a whole lot of things. Could have been his All attitude, I know is that... could have been performance. Uh, again, one of the, I think Jamie Nye was saying that his effort at practice was, was quite lackluster compared to the other receivers on the field. Jamie and I wrote a great article on that. It was before this all went down, actually. So that's that's pretty interesting too. Um, yeah, Rod Peterson. I mean, all, I mean, this is this is football pundit heaven when it comes to <laughs> this kind of news, right? Rod Peterson had a great story as well on his blog, and uh, <clears throat> and I mean, Terrell Owens, right? Yes. Uh, so Jones said in the little scrum he had on Sunday, uh, "This has nothing to do with Owens. It's not related." Well, there's room yeah. for him now. They they freed up some money. There's definitely a spot on the field. Yeah, uh, Nick Marshall and I can see back. Jones doing that. Mm-hmm. We didn't release Carter for any reason to do with Terrell Owens. However, now that we've released Carter, we have room for Terrell Owens. Like exactly, if, if, if he bridges, <laughs> if, if he bridges that gap, you know, there's going to be a lot of upset Ryder fans. <laughs> and talk about upset Ryder fans. That, so one of the first things uh, once uh, this this Carter release. Uh, broke, people were calling for the head of Chris Jones. Asking for petitions yes, to get rid of were. Jones. So what do you think about that? Uh, I think petitions in this case are stupid. You know, I'm not going to sign a petition, but um, <laughs> I understand the passion that goes behind those petitions. I understand Ryder fans. They want successful football, and they see Jones as making a lot of irrational decisions that they wouldn't necessarily make. We don't get the reasoning behind a lot of the decisions Jones makes, and that frustrates people. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell people not to call for the firing of Chris Jones. That's you know their speech, freedom of speech. They can do whatever they want, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know, hey, we're last place in the West. We just released the star player yeah. because 
a lot of people argue we weren't using him right. That's one of the reasons why we're last place. So there's a lot to put on the shoulders of, of Chris Jones here. So I'm, I'm not going to give him a pass on any of that. That's for sure. But I, I, I still think there's a plan there. He's try, he's trying to figure it out. He's not showing all his cards, not to the media, not to the fans. Yeah. Maybe that's for a book, uh, you know, ten years from now. But I, I think it's, yeah. you don't want to and change have... co- coaches at this point in the season. You don't want to even go down that road at all. No, because then this year's a wash up. Next year's a wash up, and then we're exactly where we are with Chris Jones, anyways. The NFL cuts are coming. So, I mean, this could be a big reason for that as, as well. Mm-hmm. Jones might be having his eyes on certain NFL guys. You know, I don't know. But if we don't get a sizable, comparable replacement for Carter in the next few weeks, then this, this, this release is useless, right? So I imagine we are going to see a few new guys join the team here with the space in the cap that Deron Carter has left us. You'd think so. Yeah, he'd definitely but bring some people in shortly. One of the things I wanted to mention was about Chris Jones and the people. The reason people call for the firing of him. I think Chris Jones understands the way Rider Nation works. And I think Chris Jones just intentionally decides not to do business that way. You know, we want a guy who's open and honest and and isn't kind of ruthless with his players. Uh, we loved Ken Miller, right? We love him. He was like everybody's grandpa. You know, he was great. Um, It got us to two back-to-back great cups. Couldn't get the win. But Jones is so different from Ken Miller. Jones is more of the... um, I I think Jones is very financially savvy sort of thing. I think he spends a lot of times looking at the, the, the dollar amounts. The dollar amounts are really important to Jones. And and I think that's... You know, he is the GM Maybe he's more fit for GM than a head coach. Maybe he'd be the best GM in the world if he wasn't also being a coach. You know, uh, so it's really tough to to defend the way Jones goes about things because he will seemingly make an error, like like we saw with Carter being put on defense, and we talked extensively about that. And then he'll mm-hmm. double down on that error. Then he then he'll change his mind and say, yeah, we'll put Carter on offense now, you know, because we're, we were down in the um, Calgary game or whatever it was. And then, uh, and then it's too late. And then he's like, well, you know what? I'll just release him. And it's like, well, well, you know, you know, we saw the same thing kind of with Weston Dressler. When Weston Dressler got released, Dressler went on Twitter and he said, they didn't want to sign me. There was no way I was yeah. going to resign with this team. And, you know, Chris Jones gave a very different story. And the, the fans were inclined to believe Weston Dressler. You know, there was no counter offer given from Saskatchewan on Dressler's contract. That's how negotiations work. Uh, and Jones I, said we couldn't come to an agreement. So, wow. yeah, like a five foot ten receiver. I don't think he was interested in. Period. There was this, he didn't right. work he's, in his in his plans. And he's still scoring touchdowns for Winnipeg. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. Like, so he is. Yeah, definitely. Jones has a way of doing things, and that's how it is. I don't know how much he listens to the media or listens to the criticism, but he doesn't seem to want to. He's he's not he's not caving to anyone. That's for sure. And part of that's good, right? As long as he has this plan that he's gonna. If he gets us to the playoffs this year, then great. He continues to be the coach of the Rough Riders. If we miss the playoffs. You know, that it's going to be hard to hold back Rider Nation from asking for, for change. Yeah, you mentioned that last podcast with Cavis Reed. If Cavis Reed misses the playoffs after all of this work that he's put on, getting Johnny Football in there and having such a horrible season, how do you rehire a guy for, you know, putting your team in that situation? <clears throat> uh, yeah, if Chris Jones doesn't make the playoffs. <laughs> There's going to be some pretty upset Ryder fans, yeah. and it's already looking the the West is. Oh, it's so. I don't hard want to now. say the West is. Yeah, the West isn't running away from us, but it's getting there. With with Travis uh, Lule waking up the BC Lions, Winnipeg's playing well, and then what is it? Hamilton lost this week, so like it, it, no one's doing us any favors this week. We're we're in the basement. Riders are in the basement now. Yeah. So I think we've covered Duran here. I understand you're going to get out there with the family to watch the meteor shower. Uh, did you anything else you want to touch about touch on about uh, the last week of games? You just here? mentioned, 
Yeah, you just mentioned Travis Lule, and uh, a couple weeks ago, after the loss that Travis Lule had, he uh, post game he said something about there was a lot of little mistakes. We can fix those. There was a lot of small errors. We know what we did wrong here. We know what we did wrong here. We can fix those. This isn't a whole team collapsing. And he goes, next week, you know, I know we're going to fix those and be better. And that was, it was such a mature right. comment. Normally you get those cliche, uh, uh, you know, we just got to try better. We just got to do this. You know, it was a, it, 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 from Travis Lule, those, those comments were very non-cliche. They sounded something like what a coach would say. And when I heard those, that's when I was like, BC is going to win this game against Edmonton. And that's exactly what they did. And that's the kind of thing we're not hearing from the riders. You know, Zach Kolaris, obviously his first start back, it's going to take him a little while to get back in the groove and to assess his own team as he, as he jumps in there. But, but yeah, BC, like you said, BC could be at the beginning of a, of a run Mm -hmm. right now. They could be at the beginning of a a win streak. That puts the riders in danger. Like we're looking at a crossover position at best, if we lose to Calgary, like you know, if we if we continue this downward spiral, it's going to be hard to get out of it. We got Calgary coming up, and that's that's no easy. They're undefeated. Yeah, and even in that loss, Edmonton, Edmonton is damn good football team. Like Mike mm-hmm. Riley, he's unreal. Uh, watching that game again, I wanted to say, I think uh, Mike Riley is in fact the best best QB in the league. Nothing taken away from any of the other guys. Nothing to take away from Bo Levi and Mitchell, but I believe. Bo Levi Mitchell is part of a system and that his system is really, really good and that you could put another guy in there and he could perform almost as good as Bo Levi Mitchell. But I believe Mike Riley, he's practically a one-man show with a good team around him. So Edmonton, you know, ah, geez, they're good. <laughs> and if BC beat him, then, you know, we got some work to do. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's hard in the West. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Dylan. We'll catch up with you next week. Sorry, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go take off. I'm gonna enjoy the summer weather here, and uh, I just finished my cup of coffee, so my time is out. That's for sure. Next up, we have Grey Cup I champion hope. Chris Best on the show. Also, Bryce Wiles will be uh, joining and uh, firing some question at Best. Sorry, you're gonna miss that, Dylan. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss that too. Awesome that you guys have Chris Best on the show. I'm looking forward to hearing it. So now this is cool. Because I'm not going to be here for the rest of the podcast. I'm just going to I'm just going to have to listen, all listen right. into the rest of the podcast, like all, all the other listeners. All right. Do you have a question for Best? Oh man, I would have had a lot of questions for Best, but um, I'd love to hear his take on Deron Carter because that's an insider's perspective, you know. So I'd love to hear what he has to say about that. All right. Coming up next, Chris Best. Welcome back, and we are excited to have on the show 2013 Grey Cup champion, 10-year CFL vet, retired rider, number 66, Chris Best. Chris, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Yeah, first time. Uh, should be a lot of fun. Great. And also on the line, Bryce Wiles joins us for the second segment here. And uh, let's get into it. Uh, we are just talking about Deron Carter, sort of an unexpected release over the weekend. Chris, uh how do you feel? What do you think about that news that's coming down? I mean, I think if you look at the system, uh, the the situation objectively, we knew this was going to end in tears at some point. Like, Duran Carter, we see you, Duran, all the time. He, he's the guy who wears his emotions on his sleeve, so we know what sort of guy he is. Obviously, Chris Jones is a very confident man and believes in himself and his abilities. So we knew at some point this was going to end in tears and there was going to be a rough breakup. I honestly did not expect it to come to a head so quickly, but, I mean, yeah, here we are. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Duran does have a history uh, with Montreal, and um, even with the Indianapolis Col- Colts, he got cut from the Colts too. So um, yeah, I guess you're right; it was bound to bound to happen. Receivers like that, like great talent level. Obviously, there's a point when the hassle they give you, like the amount of trouble they give you, becomes mm-hmm. uh, more than the talent they're giving you. And like when those two things cross, that's when guys like that get cut. I mean, obviously, once again, I didn't think we were at that point yet, but I mean. Clearly, the guys inside the uh, administration there feel it was time to get rid of Duran. They tried to trade him, no offers, because everyone knew what a head case he was, and so now that's it. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, he's got – well, his his dad is Chris Carter, like an accomplished NFL wide receiver, right? So 
Mm-hmm. I wonder if there's like, some entitlement or maybe some attitude that just doesn't mesh with the other players, possibly. Yeah, hearing from the guys in the locker room, they say he's not a bad guy. Like, they mm-hmm. like him, but, like, he's, I don't know, he's very stubborn. Like, he very, he'll argue to the point where, like, you don't want to argue anymore. Like, he just, I mean, as I said, you kind of see Duran. Like, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He's out yeah. there, like, giving his all, doing great things, doing dumb things. Like, he just kind of, you get it all with Duran. <laughs> yeah, during the, the Chris Jones press conference today, he talked about how he wasn't doing the daily meetings with Duran that he did last year that sort of helped. Mm-hmm. keep him in check and keep everything on an even keel and i guess uh treating him just like one of the other players wasn't so maybe, maybe it let his his attitude get a little bit out of hand but we don't have to dwell too much on carter i'd like to get your your thoughts on a bunch of stuff here sure if we get so we back up to the start of the year the riders let Derek dennis go so another sort of unexpected mm-hmm. release now it's been a while now and i guess uh derrick's been hired on in calgary starting in calgary do you have any thoughts on that release and how that sort of played out? Yeah, I think it was kind of just a, a question. It wasn't a great system fit for Derek because obviously he's a, he's a good dude. I've met him before, and he's obviously he's back in Calgary playing left tackle and doing well. But I know under our system last year with a bunch of like long dropbacks, you got to hold up a while. He was struggling up there at left tackle, hmm. and they kicked him into left guard because he just couldn't play left tackle for us anymore. And he did fine. He did okay. But if you're an American playing left guard, which is traditionally a Canadian spot, and making the sort of money that Derek was making, you have to be a, like a world beater. You have to be a monster in there. And he was just doing fine. So, like, I was – yeah, this, it wasn't that surprising to me, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just – yeah. And obviously, he's a talented guy because you see him go back to Calgary, and he's doing just fine. So, it was mostly a question of, like, our system just didn't really fit him. And he's now he's hungry, he's motivated again, and he's playing good, uh, good out there in Calgary. So, good for him. But I understand why the Riders let him go with that one-year experiment. I wish we had found another solution at left tackle. Vaughn is doing okay. But, uh, yeah, this is, it's one of those failed experiments that didn't quite work. Yeah, and that's what sort of the next question is. What, how, do you, how are you seeing our O-line play this year? What, what, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Um, we've been up and down for sure. And it's, it's too bad. I just still have friends on the team. Obviously, still have guys that, like my brother playing uh, out on the offensive line. But you can see – struggles and i think a lot of the struggles looks like it looks like communication stuff like um you see when twists when like uh defensive ends defensive tackles and they cross it's called a twist and when they're easy to pick up if you're on the same page as the guys right around you but if you are not on the same page they are impossible and that's how you, you know quarterback you get picked the guys will hit the quarterback really easily like everyone looks like fools out there like so that that's that sort of thing you got to practice a bunch and you have to be comfortable with the guys beside you. And, like, there's been multiple situations I've watched out there where, like, you can just tell people are not on the same page. Like, they're just – we're getting eaten alive out there on things that we should be able to pick up because we have the talent. The offensive line is one of those special places where all five really have to work uh, as one. And if all five are not working as one, it becomes very obvious. And your quarterback just gets smacked around, as we've seen a couple times this year. Yeah, I'd like to, to uh, just ask you something about playing on the O-line and what's it like – to play the whole game and you're pretty much in an all out fight with like one guy kind of like all game. What's, what's that like? <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I, I miss it. Like I don't miss playing football anymore, but I do miss like, there was something to be said for like, yeah, you, you put your hand in the dirt. He picks it, puts his hand in the dirt. You just pick it up and you just start fighting for 60, 65 plays a game, you know? And like, it wasn't even less like animosity. Like, well, that depends on the guy. Some guys I hated, but like some guys, you could even kind of have a bit of a conversation <laughs> over the course of the game. Yeah, oh, the guy used to play for BC, Aaron Hunt. I miss him. We used to be able to talk all game long, and he was a funny, funny dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there's like some trash talking too. A little bit, going. but I was a terrible trash talker, so I didn't like some guys trash talk a ton. Uh, my old, uh, my old center, who's now obviously doing very well with the Rough Riders, Jamie O'Day, he was a phenomenal trash talker. He would trash talk anyone. I saw him do, like really? tear stuff off the refs before. Oh yeah, he was great. Like <laughs> he that. seems so professional <laughs> right now, you know, doing the assistant GM or what, whatever the title is right now. So he was a trash talker. Yeah, when he when he was a player, he was a different beast for sure. Yeah, I had a lot of fun playing beside Jo. <laughs> and that leads us to <laughs> another, right. like, oh, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Well, yeah, I mean, that's trash talk definitely part of it, and some guys are better than other guys, and. Some guys, you know, if you talk too much, like, then other guys will take uh, special pleasure in, you know, kind of taking it out on you. So it's, like, you got to be careful. Like, 65 plays in a game, if you are a jerk, if you do something stupid to someone early in the game, like a cheap shot, like, you know, he has a lot of chances to get back at you, right? So, like, 
if you, you know, you cheap shot a guy, like it, he might wait a couple quarters and all of a sudden you'll find yourself in a bad spot and you will just get obliterated by the same guy. So like you really, there's a, there's a little bit of respect there. There's a little bit of like, you know, like you got a lot of plays ahead of you. So you kind of have to, you, you got to go through it, I guess. It's, it's hard to explain, but just, you got to, there's a little bit of res- definitely respect between the offensive and defensive lines. Well, Charleston mm-hmm. Hughes was a sort of a rider killer. He was, you know, fans hated when he came into Taylor Field. I assume you had a you're playing inside, but you must have had a chance to play against him. Now he's a rider. Uh, do you have any memories mm-hmm. of Charleston Hughes? Oh yeah, Charleston, especially with Cal- Calgary's crazy defenses over the years. They used to hide, hide, you kind of see it now with Toby and Tigua, What they used to do with Charleston, like they just hide him in the weeds out there. He'd be out playing cornerback and then flying in from the side. Like it was. I, I definitely got a lots of, lots of chance to see Charleston because they like to move him around to like they, they always feel the guards are not as quick as tackles. So they like to put fast guys like Charleston on us and see how we do. And uh, I think only ever gave up one sack against him. And I was super embarrassed because it was a bad sack. And we both, he actually made fun of me after because he knew it was a bad sack and he knew I was better than that. But we definitely had our battles over the years. Charleston, he's, he's just a heck of a player. Like he's got great technique, great strength, even at his age. And he just does not quit. Like, you think you blocked him, you blocked his second move, you blocked his third move, you blocked his fourth move. He just won't stop. So if that quarterback doesn't get rid of the ball or does something strange, like, he's going to get a sack on you and you're going to look like a fool. And it's just, that's that's Charleston's game. And he's been doing it at a very high level for a very long time. So hats off to him. I, I want to, another, another of those old guys I've had lots of conversations with. And he's, he's a good dude for sure. And I'm glad to see the success he's having here in uh, Saskatchewan. Yeah, one of the better or best pickups for the riders in the off season. Bryce, do you have a question? Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, <clears throat> you're a first round draft pick, but I wonder if you have any um, any memorable moments from playing college in Duke. Uh, if there was any any kind of college stories that you could maybe tell us that are friendly for for the air listeners out there. Oh, sure. I mean. Uh, I went to Duke University, which is obviously a great uh, school, but not a great football school. So we were not very good. Um, so I got to play in a lot of other teams' homecomings, which was a lot of fun. I remember one of my my second or third game I ever played were in uh, Florida State for their homecoming game. Uh, this is in Tallahassee, Florida. They have 85,000 people all dressed in their wow. garnet and gold, as I call it, yeah. just screaming for blood. And I'm like this 19-year-old uh, sophomore looking around. Like, you can literally feel the vibrations in the field coming up from your feet. Like, it's so loud. You can't hear anything. It's like, I- I'm going to die. I- I'm going to die out here. <laughs> so it was, it was just, it's, I mean, obviously CFL crowds are great and CFL is intense. But, like, U.S. college football, especially in the southern U.S., is just a different animal. Like, you just get, like, you get 100,000 people in a stadium. And, like, that's every single Saturday for these people. That's what they do. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. As I said, not a lot of victories because uh, Duke's doing a lot better now. But when I was there, we were one of the worst teams in the, all of the Division One football. But uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I had a lot of fun down there. And just the things I got to see, like 85,000 people chanting for my blood. Like, yeah, it's uh, hard to forget those sort of things. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. The really good thing, though, about that is actually because I, I always played on bad teams in college. When I finally got to the Rough Riders, it was really nice to finally have a home crowd that really was cheering for you. That was my first time since high school that I really had the home crowd that was friendly. So that was awesome. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, going to talking about uh, memories of uh, Saskatchewan, was there any, like, pranks or any any memories from from your career with the Riders that uh, you didn't want to share? Although, I mean, there are tons of pranks. Like, obviously, uh, the Phantom comes out every training camp. That's for rookies who don't behave. The Phantom will get them. And, uh, you know, so that's – but uh, you never what's, know the what's Phantom. What's the Phantom? The, Phantom's a strange, the Phantom is a strange and mysterious beast that uh, lets the rookies know when they're not doing a good job. So uh, I, can't, I can't comment on too many Phantom stories, but I did have a funny story that came to me. Um, 2013, when we were uh, – offensive line was the NFA crew. We were uh, obviously a very tight-knit uh, crew. And um, – We'd always eat lunch together and go watch film after practice. And we had a lunchroom right off from the main locker room in the old uh, Mosaic Field there. And uh, so we'd all eat lunch together. And, like, usually a couple guys who we'd like would come eat lunch with us. Usually Brian Peters, a linebacker, would come eat lunch with us. Uh, Paul Waldo. And then um, a certain DB, who I don't want to name names, would always come in. Great guy, but he'd always kind of mess with us. And uh, we'd always let him know, like, one of these days we're going to get you, man. And so once uh, he came in and he messed with us and went out, and we knew he was going to come back around. So we closed. There was two doors in the room. We closed the far door and pulled up this big thing of saran wrap that we had ready for him. 
and he came back in the other door and started uh, chirping us again. So we took him. Uh, it took all of us. To his, to his credit, he fought tooth and nail, but it took all, like, 14 of us. We put him onto a chair, saran wrapped him to a chair, put him in the middle of the, uh, the locker room, put a big sign just saying hashtag NFA crew. And we said no pictures on social media, but I know a couple guys put that one out on social media. So this poor guy was just stuck in the middle of the locker room, saran wrapped to his chair. And uh, let's just say he didn't uh, – he, he still beaked us, but he never let himself get caught in a room with us like that ever again. So it, was, it was a good time awesome. for sure. And it was all love. We even told him, like, obviously 2013 was a – there were some issues with bullying in football. We told him this was just love, man. It's all love. And uh, I don't think he has any hard feelings. Just It was just a good time. <laughs> yeah. And talking about 2013 um, and, uh, and the Grey Cup, too, yeah. Give us a little oh, story yeah. about that. Oh, it was just – it was such a cool year because, like, we were obviously – we are just stacked all over. We really felt like a team of destiny all year long. Uh, obviously had some injury problems. I personally had some injury problems. I uh, tore my foot like week seven or eight there, I wouldn't recommend it. It was not much fun. But luckily I made it back in time, just just in time before the playoffs to get back out there. But, I mean, I I can't describe, especially going to the playoffs there. We knew, we knew the first game was hard, but we just felt like no matter what, we had this. And we knew, like, BC gave us all they got. Like, that was a heck of a game. And hats off to BC. Like, we were down 10 at halftime there in the Western semis at home. But we knew after we took everything BC had, Darian put us on his back. And won that game for us. We knew it was like, no, we, we got this. We, we already won these next two games. We don't, doesn't even, we don't have to play them. And so sure enough, we show up in Calgary next week. It's a cold game. That's fine. We're ready for the cold. And we knew that Calgary was frozen already. It was like they were wearing all their cold weather gear stuff. We're walking outside with T-shirts. It's like minus 20. Like, we're, we're ready for this. We've we played in cold weather games already. And just proceed to uh, beat the crap out of uh, Calgary there in the Western Final. And then uh, we knew that Hamilton was we, – we destroyed Hamilton twice already that year. They didn't uh, – they didn't have anything that scared us. So we, were, we also knew that we'd already won that game. We were just going to go over there and just show them what we were made of, especially with our, uh, our big entry there. My personal recollection was it was Ricky Foley's idea for us all to run out um, right. at the start. I remember Ricky asking me if it was a big deal. But I think I, different people say it was different people. To me, it's always Ricky Foley. And, like, as soon as we ran out out there and, like, just, like, all right, we got this. We know. Like, we're, we're like, we almost – it felt like Team of Destiny. It's, like, total – stereotypical like you know like movie stuff but it really <laughs> i've never in my career felt like even before a game it's like it doesn't even matter like we have already beat these guys and we're gonna blow their doors off and then we did so it was it was an incredible year and it was such a privilege to be involved with such an amazing team like that like playing with guys like g-roy like like we literally we brought the goat in one of the best receivers ever and he just you know mm-hmm. happened to play for our team like we just you know dressler gets we had ridiculous receivers Corey sheets blocking for that guy was a lot of fun. He'd always yeah. make you look good. And uh, obviously, Darian was just outstanding that year. Our defense was a buzzsaw that year. It was like we, it was really a team of destiny. And I'm just so happy I got a chance to be involved in that. And uh, luckily for me, I know the partying happened for a long time after, but uh, my daughter was born in January after the Grey Cup. So I, I had to cut my partying short after that, which is probably good for longevity of my career and my liver <laughs> after that. <laughs> Thank you so much for the chat. I- that's pretty much everything we want to talk about. But there's, I guess, before we go, uh, riders have Calgary this week coming up. What are your thoughts? What do the riders have to do to give Calgary their first loss? I mean, we almost gave them the formula last time. Like I'd say, obviously, the first key is don't spot them twenty four points in the first quarter. Yeah, because uh, mm-hmm. that, that. I mean, because even with that, even giving them twenty four points, we still almost won that game. We were in it all the way to late in the fourth quarter with Brandon Bridge still the quarterback. And Brandon Bridge was running a bit of a handicapped offense, which was too bad, but that's what we were running. So if we don't spot him 24 points, if uh, our offense plays similar to we play, uh, I'd like a little better, but at least similar, you know, a proficient offense out there uh, up front, you know, by, led by Caleros, a good running game. Like, we really – we got a shot, you know. Like, we, we showed we got a shot last time. Our defense is amazing. Our teams, especially with Christian Jones back there, he's mm-hmm. a threat to take it back every single time to yeah. the ball. It's incredible. Yeah, he's quick. So if we just get like a, a decent, if we get a great, great, great defense, great teams, and a, a decent offensive performance, we will definitely be in this game. And I'm, I'm excited for it. You know, like I think we need a big win. We need to kind of put all this drama behind us here and yeah. just kind of focus on the team moving forward here. So, uh, and someone's got to be Calgary eventually. I really hope it's going to be us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, their O has to go for sure. We, what we always felt about Calgary was like, obviously they've been great in the regular season. My whole career is going back to 2007. They've been great in the regular season. 
we always felt when it got cold and like got in the playoffs, like they just, they weren't built for the cold. They were kind of front runners. And so far that seems to be true. But I mean, like hats off to Calgary for their regular season success. But we always felt like if we got in the playoffs, we got them. And that's almost always been true. So uh, I guess we'll see how the season develops. Yeah. And hopefully the Riders make it in the playoffs in the basement at the moment, yeah. but just a little bit of digging to get out of there. You're right. First things first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Chris, for being on the show. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Chris Best, 2013 Great Cup champion, for uh, coming on the show. That was a great chat. Oh, well, Bryce. Yep. The week of football. Do you have any additional thoughts? Well, you know, when, it, when it's a ride or bye week, you got to talk about something in the CFL. So let's uh, let's just go over a little bit about what happened here in the CFL this week. And you know what we're seeing here is an awakening of the BC Lions. They're yeah. undefeated at home. And uh, Lule's looking good, and they, they beat Edmonton. And um, another thing I noticed about that game with the mic'd up, and you could see Riley, and he's directing traffic, and you can really um, kind of imagine how confusing the offensive plays must be because a lot of times he's telling the running backs, no, you're on the right side, or he's, he's yelling at the receivers, and maybe he's changing the plays, and he's – and um, I just kind of noticed that. I kind of – at the first, I, I didn't like the mic'd up, Mm-hmm. But now it's starting to grow on me. I, I kind of oh, like yeah, you can uh, get inside. getting inside there. Yeah, for sure. You can hear when the audibles happen, or as you were saying, when uh, there's some disarray on the field and they're trying to figure stuff out. Definitely mm-hmm. a lot of uh, muting during the Edmonton game. I think a lot of probably F-bombs whatnot yeah. coming out. Well, you, if you could read lips, you could probably figure out what, what was being said. But uh, And then, yeah, we can move along there to um, uh, Winnipeg. And, ooh, was it? Big Hill, Adam Big Hill. Yeah, yeah the he had, East he had a is good game. the East is not doing the Riders any favors, right? So no, Hamilton falls to helping. Winnipeg, uh, putting, yeah. and that just puts us, you know, firmly in the basement there with uh, BC and Winnipeg winning. But Mazzoli was he was trying to put the team on his back. He was yeah. calling his own number a lot, and uh, they were they were still in the game there, but. He reminds me now of like a Darian Durant, you know, like he can yeah he can make some throws, he can run, he's a tough guy. And he just tries to get it done, but uh, uh, fell short there, twenty nine to twenty three to Winnipeg. Yeah, and then in the, the last game there, um, Montreal Ottawa. And um, hey, Johnny Football, he didn't throw an interception, but he was he was only like sixty one percent completion. But sixty one percent is pretty good. But uh, the yardage, yeah. right, one hundred sixty eight yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions. That's sort of like the Brandon Bridge type numbers. Uh, what, mm-hmm. what he's and. And Montreal was ahead too. Ottawa had to come back. Oh yeah. And what? And so, like, I think uh, I think Johnny Johnny Manziel is kind of starting to starting to ease back into it. I think he's going to get comfortable, and he he might he might Montreal might be a um, might it be that team that ruins a lot of other teams' playoff. Uh, well, hopes. yeah. Well, they could ruin the Riders' playoffs hopes if they start to wake up, because uh, right now, you know, we got to get a win just to try to get a crossover spot. And oh. Ottawa's rookie kicker there, Ward. He's got 22 consecutive field goals for a rookie. Like that's a that's a pretty amazing stat there. Um, just to finish up on Montreal, and the reason I think they can turn it around that Tyrell Sutton is quite the running back, right? Ten carries, yeah. 63 yards. But geez, he's he uh, he was a big reason why Montreal did well against the Riders earlier in the year. And their receiving core is is not too bad with uh, B.J. Cunningham, Ernest Jackson, Jackson, and Adarius Bowman. So they got some talent there once they all get on the same page. But the Riders need Montreal to continue to struggle, Toronto to continue to struggle, and uh, either what Winnipeg or B.C. to sort of fall back. But it's it's going to be a tough tough uh, rest of the season. But a lot of games still to play. Okay. Yep. So let's jump ahead. We've had a a full show already, and let's just go to the meh of the week. So that week clapping means it's time for the meh of the week. And my candidate for the meh of the week, Bryce, I'm not sure if you'll agree with me, is this second buy. Two buys in a year. Another week without the Riders playing. It's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's going to be my meh of the week, too. We're, we're just hungry for football. And uh, they're taking football away from us. So like, John, come Johnny on. Manziel gets 
out of the meta of the week. He was in there a couple of times with his disappointing <laughs> uh, performances. But yes, this bye week it's tough. I understand uh, the team's gonna get healthier and uh, and be you know be ready to play Calgary. But it's tough to sit through a whole week without the Riders playing. All right, that's the meta of the week. Leading us to closing the show with predictions. First up is Ottawa at Winnipeg. Who do you have, Ottawa at Winnipeg? Ooh, that's gonna be a that's gonna be a real tough one. But I just I'm gonna go with Winnipeg. I just yeah, yeah, I don't it's know. It's gonna why. be a good match. It's good. good uh, it's, it's a hard one, hard one to call. Good game. I'll cheer for Ottawa because we want Winnipeg to lose. Next up, BC at Toronto. Who do you like? I think BC is gonna keep that role going. Mm-hmm. I think they're gonna beat Toronto. Yeah, Travis Lule is he's got his team back, right? So, and they're yeah. definitely the team's behind him. They're getting momentum. BC wins that one. Next up, Saturday, Montreal's in Edmonton. Has Montreal got a chance against Riley? Uh, no chance. No, no chance. chance. I, Edmonton's going to take that one. Yeah, that's a tough draw for his third game there, Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, Edmonton wins that one. That's our call. And finally, the live Mike game Sunday, Calgary at Saskatchewan. Now, Bryce, we have an idea of where you're going to go on this one, given your previous picks. So go ahead. Well, uh, you know. I want to say I want to say Saskatchewan, but Calgary's just too strong, and I I think Calgary's going to win. Now, because uh, Dylan is not with us for this segment, I have to you know represent Dylan a little bit and go Saskatchewan with the win. Obviously, at home, the Riders are going to win on passion and passion alone, as he says. <laughs> well, Dylan would <laughs> would say that he would. Yes, yes, he would. Okay, so that's predictions, and that brings us to the end of the show. And the last word goes to you, Bryce. What do you got? Well, I'm just going to say one thing. I'm just going to say this. In Jones, we trust. Jones is going to be the captain of this ship, and mm-hmm. he's either going to go down with the ship to the bottom of the ocean, or he's going to sail the riders to the promised land. That's the show <laughs> for this week. For Bryce Wiles and Dylan Robson, I'm Mitch Wiles. A big thank you to Chris Best for being on the show. This was The Rider Outsiders. <laughs>